to decide what side of the line to shade. Okay, so for example, what about when x is negative 1 and y is 0? So if I take negative 1 for x and 0 for y, would I get a true statement or a false statement? True. True. Which means I am going to shade that side of the line so it looks like this. And notice the part that I shaded twice. is all right in this region. Okay, so the area that I shaded twice, that is actually my solution set. Okay, so what I can do is I can erase the part I don't want. Which means you definitely want to have a pencil when you do this. Okay, and then what's left is the solution. Okay? Pretty easy, right? Okay, now let's compare this to another example for a moment. Okay, now in this case, we have a system of inequalities. They don't necessarily have to be linear, as you can see. So the first thing I'm going to do is graph the curve for y equals x squared minus 1. Now, am I going to draw a solid curve or a dashed curve? In other words, is the curve itself included or not included? Right, so we want a solid curve. Okay, and then do you think I want the top or the bottom of that curve to shade? Right, because we want values of y that are greater than that. So it basically looks something like this. Okay, now y is less than 3. We know if we had y equals 3, that would be represented by a horizontal line. But is that line part of the solution? No, so what kind of line do I have to draw? Right, dash. Okay, and then do I want to shade below or above that line? Which basically means I now know my solution is right in here. And then I can go back and erase the part that's not in my solution. Okay, now look at the difference between these. Notice this one is completely enclosed. We call that a bounded solution. Now, is this one completely enclosed? No, it basically is like open on one side, so it goes on forever. So what do you think we would call that? It's an unbounded solution. Okay, sometimes you get a bounded solution, sometimes you get an unbounded solution, and sometimes you get no solution. Like, let me give you a very simple case of having no solution. Okay, so look at this system of inequalities. Okay, so if I graph this, <coughs> now notice the first inequality, if we treat that as an equation, we have x and y intercepts of 3, right? So 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Am I going to connect these with a dash 
or solid line? Dash. And then notice the second one, we would do the same thing except the x and y intercepts are negative 1, right? Now, when you decide what side to shade, let's say for this dashed line, I use the test point 0, 0. Is it true that 0 plus 0 is greater than 3? No, which means I shade this side. Now, how about for the second inequality, is it true that 0 plus 0 is less than negative 1? Which means I have to shade the other side. And there it is. Okay? So our solution would be the intersection of the two shaded regions. So what's the solution? Right, there is no solution. Okay, and that happens sometimes, okay? Just like when we had systems of equations, sometimes there are no solutions. And remember that usually occurred when you had parallel lines, right? Okay, well here we have two parallel lines and we have no solution. Now, do you think that every time we have parallel lines that we're gonna have no solution? No, if I change either one of these inequality signs, if I change this to a less than, or if I change this to a greater than, then obviously we would have a solution. Okay? I mean, let me just consider doing that real quick. So let's just take the second one, and suppose I just change it to that. Okay? That means instead of shading this side, I would shade the other side, right? Okay, and remember the solution would be the part that's shaded twice. The only part that would be shaded twice would be the same part that I shaded with the first inequality, right? Which basically means the solution to this system is the same as the solution to what? Right, the first inequality. Okay? I mean, the second inequality doesn't really give you any other information, right? Okay, so saying that something has to be at least three, it doesn't really tell you anything new if I say, oh yeah, and it better be at least negative one. Okay, so if it, something already has to be greater than three, we already know that it must be greater than negative one, so this would basically add nothing new to the solution. Okay, so there's just a couple cases that you might see. Now, where this gets interesting is where we use it for applications, and where it gets even more interesting is when we use it in the next section called linear programming, where we're actually going to find values that optimize some sort of application problem. Okay, but for right now, let's look at an example. Okay, example number nine. Now, this is an example where the math is very, very simple. The biggest challenge for you guys is actually just going to be interpreting the problem in English, trying to figure out what it wants, and then how to get started. Okay, so I'm going to read the problem for you, and then I'm going to start writing a system of inequalities to describe the problem as I continue to do that. Okay, it says, the liquid portion of a diet is to provide at least 300 calories. Okay, we can call that a constraint. Okay, we have a minimum that we need to meet. 36 units of vitamin A and 90 units of vitamin C. Now, as soon as I see that word at least, I'm already thinking about what kind of inequality? Right, greater than or equal to. That would be at least. Okay, so it says a cup of dietary drink X provides 60 calories, 12 units of vitamin A, 10 units of vitamin C. A cup of dietary drink Y provides 60 calories, 6 units of vitamin A, and 30 units of vitamin C. Set up a system of linear inequalities that describes how many cups of each drink should be consumed 
each day to meet or exceed the minimum daily requirements for calories and vitamins. So we have two types of drinks, X and Y. We want to know how many cups of each drink should be consumed, which means we have to solve for X and Y. Okay, so we can just say let X equal the number of cups of drink X, right? And then so Y would be what? Number of cups. All right, the same thing, but number of cups of drink Y. Okay, now let's see if we can set up some inequalities. Now, we know that we need to get at least 300 calories. So something has to be at least 300. The number of calories that come from drink X plus the number of calories that come from drink Y must be at least 300. So every cup of drink X provides how many calories? If you look at the problem. Right, so 60. Okay, plus the number of calories that come from drink Y. How would I express that? 60. 60Y. Okay, so this is one constraint based on calories. Now let's consider the vitamin A. Okay, so how would I express the total contributed by X and Y? So every cup of X provides how much of vitamin A? 12 units, right? Plus, how do I express the amount that comes from drink Y? And that has to be greater than or equal to what? Okay, now we also have a constraint for vitamin C. Okay, so how would I express that inequality? So let's see if you can do the whole thing for me. So x times what? 10, 10 plus 30y. 30y has to be at least what? 90. 90. Okay, so it looks like we have a system of inequalities already. Now, there are two more inequalities that I could write that I haven't even yet considered, but for many applications, it's true that you cannot have negative quantities. Would it make sense for x or y to be negative here? No. No. So that means x has to be at least what? Zero. And so does y. So we have a system of five inequalities. Now just so you know, these two extra inequalities actually make the problem easier because we only have to deal with the first quadrant, right? So let's just draw a graph of the first quadrant and I can ignore the other quadrants. Okay, so let's see here. Starting with this, what's the x value or the x-intercept, I mean? If I treat this as an equation, what would the x-intercept be? Five. Five and the y-intercept? Okay, also five. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Am I going to connect these with a solid or a dashed line? Okay, and remember, this time I can limit myself to the first quadrant. Okay, now look at the second inequality. What is the x-intercept? What is the y-intercept? Okay, now the third inequality. What is the x-intercept? And the y? Oh, the y-intercept is what? A oh, three, right? Now notice I haven't done any shading yet, okay? I could shade one side of each line as I draw each line, but I can promise you that when you have many, many inequalities, 
it's going to make a big mess. Okay? In some cases, it's better to at least try to use your memory a little bit, or at least to try to wait until the end and then figure out what side to shade. But what's nice about all these is they all have the same inequality sign, and for any of these lines, if I try the point zero, zero, is it going to be true? Is zero ever bigger than 300 or 36 or 90? Uh -huh. No, so we know that for every single one of these lines, we have to shade that side, right? Which means the entire solution must be completely outside all three of these, so I can shade it like this. Okay, so now we have a picture of our solution set. Now, by the way, is this a bounded or unbounded solution? Right, it's unbounded. Now, if I wanted to make this a more realistic problem, usually we would have other constraints. For example, if I go infinitely in this direction, that would require an infinite amount of money, right? <laughs> to purchase the x and the y. I mean, can you think of any situation where somebody would have an infinite amount of money? No, so if I wanted to maybe add something to this problem, then I might say, suppose the person only has so much money to spend, okay, per day on these dietary drinks. And let's say I tell you that drink x Let's say that costs fifty cents per cup, and let's say I tell you that drink Y costs one dollar per cup. And let's say that the most we want to spend per day is let's say fifty dollars. Okay? Actually, that's probably even too much. I mean, who wants to spend $50 a day on dietary drinks? Okay, that would probably be a little too much. So let's think of something practical. Now, we know that we need to have at least maybe nine or, of one of these types of drinks or more. Okay, so that would be about $9. So let's say, how about $10? Okay, so our budget, okay, the, the maximum amount of money we want to spend on these drinks would be no more than $10 per day. Now, based on those, I could create additional inequalities, right? So, based on all three of these, what is the inequality that I can write? And here, I'll get you started. 0.5x plus... Uh, y. Why? Okay. So there we go. That's easy enough. Now, what is the x intercept of this one? 20. What's the y-intercept? And then notice what we want would be inside of this line, right? So now I can go back and erase. That part. So you see how adding in this constraint turned it from an unbounded solution to a bounded solution? And just so you know, most real life applications do result in bounded applications. Now, one thing I haven't talked about is, okay, based on this, okay, if we want to optimize something, you know, find the optimal solution, 
exactly how many cups of X should we buy and how many cups of Y should we buy. But we haven't considered that yet. But if I wanted to optimize something, do you think I might perhaps try to maximize or minimize the cost? Yeah. Right, so based on this, okay, we could just try to minimize this quantity and then try to figure out which values of X and Y minimize that quantity. But within this region, how many values are there of X and Y that we could even try if we wanted to say, okay, how about this one? How about this one? How about this one as a trial and error? How many values of there of X and Y within this bounded region? Right, there's an infinite. Okay, but one thing we're gonna see in the next section is it turns out that the values that will optimize your solution turn out to be on these vertices, which means you only have to test a few values, and then whichever one gives you the optimal result is the winner. Okay, now I'll save that to next time. In the next section, that's what we're going to look at next. But for right now, let's see if we can do another application problem that uses the inequalities.